morning friends today we will be discussing the topic of atrioventricular septal defects i am dr deepthi kakkar assistant professor cvts department you are at un mehta institute of cardiology and research center now what is an atrioventricular septal defect it is characterized by deficiency or absence of septal tissue immediately above and below the normal level of av valves this includes the region which is normally occupied by the av septum the most common etiology appears to be the abnormal development of endocardial cushion tissues the bundle of his and the position of av node was described in these malformations by lev so embryologically speaking after the looping of the primitive cardiac tube the next step is the formation of the av septa and the formation of the av valves from the endocardial cushion tissue the endocardial cushion tissue grows towards the apex of the heart and results in the formation of a muscular ventricular component of the av septum failure failure of this results in the creation of an inlet vsd this is an animation showing the same here we can see the development of the endocardial tube cushions here is the remnant of the endo foramen primum and when the av uh, cushion does not develop in this area it leads to the formation of a inlet vsd we'll see the animation once again the absence of the atrioventricular component of the atrial septum results in the formation of a primum asd when the when it is associated with a single av valve the defect is known as a complete com av canal defect or a complete av septal defect the vsd uh, component of the avcd can vary from a small restrictive vsd to a large unrestricted vsd as the endocardial cushion grows towards the right and the left it also results in the formation of the right and the left av valve leaflets that is the normal tricuspid and mitral leaflets failure of this results in a spectrum of abnormality results from a that ranges from a simple cleft to a common av valve here the septal components of the mi uh, mitral and tricuspid valve fuse to form a superior and inferior common or bridging leaflets the characteristic features arising due to these abnormalities results in a characteristic scooped out appearance of the interventricular septum the lengthened dimension of the outlet septum to the ventricular apex results in a goose neck appearance and there is also the anterior displacement of the lv outflow tract the absence of the usual wedged position of the aortic valve results in elevation and anterior deviation of the aortic valve we will be discussing all these features in details later there is also inferior displacement of the av node and bundle of his and usually the pml which forms more than 2/3 of the circumference of the mitral valve in avcd it forms only less than a third of the circumference coming to the incidence avcd occurs in 2% of all congenital heart diseases in patients of complete av canal defects 70% children have down syndrome and of the children who have down syndrome at least 50% have avcd as a heart defect avcd is also a component of defects in cases of asplenia polysplenia and heterotaxy syndromes now av septal defect include a spectrum of malformation ranging from partial to complete partial av canal defect has only the ostium primum atrial septal defect there is a interatrial communication but there is no interventricular communication and there is a variable collection between the left superior and inferior bridging leaflets in intermediate or transitional av septal defects there are two separate av valve orifices and a restrictive inlet vsd with dense caudal attachments to the ventricular septum or the crest of the interventricular septum in case of complete avcd there are large deficiencies in the atrial and the ventricular component uh, ventricular septum along with the communication and there are there is no two separate orifices there is a common av valve orifices and the leaflets or the cauda are free floating in case of complete avcd this is an image showing partial avcd 
this is the primum defect these are the this is the portion of the cleft these are the this cleft divides the leaflet into the cephalid and anterior part and this is the corded and the uh, inferior part and there is a fibrous thickening along the margin of the cleft this is an image of a complete avcd where this is the interventricular septal defect the large inlet vsd which gives our scoop, scooped out appearance the superior and inferior leaflets are free floating and there is a large intervent interventricular connection the primum asd cannot be well appreciated in this picture because the image is from the left ventricular aspect so deficiency of the av septum results in the ostium primum asd immediately above the valves there may be an accessory parachute of fibrous tissue that causes narrowing or obstruction <coughs> leaving to the uh, causing a great gradient between the two atria occasionally the entire limbus and fossa ovalis may be absent along with the av septum in this case the condition is known as a common atrium the deficiency of the scooped out area in the inlet portion of the ventricular septum results in the large inlet vsd this deficiency can vary in size and depth and it is more in case of complete av canal the interatrial or interventricular con communications depend on the com configuration and attachments of the av valves now there could be five or more av valve leaflets of variable size however the commissures and the prominent crenations in the leaflets are variable the five leaflet configuration is most common in complete avcd the leaflets are divided as left and right superior and inferior leaflets and the lateral leaflets the left superior leaflet and the left inferior leaflet are variable in size connections and the degree of bridging across the ventric crest of the interventricular septum based on this classification based on these features rastelli proposed a classification of the complete avcd type of defects this is the diagram showing the embryologic development of the atrioventricular canal region and the spectrum of avcd now this is the picture showing a development of the normal av valves this is how the normal development of the valve occurs these are the two lateral endocardial cushions and this is the superior and inferior endocardial cushions they grow towards each other leading to formation of two annuli and separation of the leaflets the leaflets developed in the mitral valve the leaflets develop as anterior and posterior and in the tricuspid they develop as anterior posterior and uh, septal leaflets where the development arrests at this stage it's lead, it leads to the formation of intermediate av canal type of defect when the development arrests at a relatively further stage it leads to transitional and when the development is arrested at this stage itself it leads to the formation of complete av canal type of defect which can be further divided into three types according to the rastelli classification which we will see in the next slides there may be one or two av valve orifices the attachment of the av valves to the crest of the interventricular septum as well as their caudal attachments are usually displaced towards the apex of the heart because of the deficiency of the inlet septum altering the orientation of the av valves is relative to the aortic orifice this we had seen before where the aortic valve it is usually wedged between the av valves this wedging is absent and leads to the elevation and anterior deviation of the aortic valve this is the image of a normal heart where the aortic valve is seen between the wedged between the two av valves this is the mitral and this is the tricuspid valve in case of avcd instead of being wedged between the av valve annulus the aortic valve is deviated anteriorly we will not be able to uh, appreciate the elevation of the valve because of the cut 
In partial AVCD, the left superior and inferior bridging leaflets are joined anteriorly near the crest of the ventricular septum, which resembles a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet. Occasionally, the chordae pass from the opposing edges of the superior and inferior bridges, bridging leaflets to the muscular septum underlying beneath it. Rarely, the separation of the left superior and inferior leaflets is represented only by a notch in the center of the free edge of the nearly normal AML. The left lateral leaflet is usually triangular and smaller than the other two leaflets. These left AV valve leaflet anomalies lead to variable degrees of regurgitation. When they are nearly completely separated, there may be an appreciable gap during systole causing significant regurgitation. Because of failure of coaptation, the tissue at the margin becomes thickened and rolled up and the regurgitant jet is usually directed into the right atrium. Rarely, the left AV valve may also be stenotic which is usually associated with a hypoplastic LV. In the normal heart, the inlet septum to the ventricular apex ratio is almost equal. The lengthening of the outlet septum to the ventricular apex results in the formation of a deformity causing known as a goose neck appearance and there is anterior displacement of the LV outflow tract. Although the outflow tract appears narrow, there is rarely occurrence of true LVOT obstruction. Unless there are some accessory chordae attached to the AV valve leaflets which are attaching to the LVOT. The LV inflow tract is also shortened and there is relative reduction in the length of the diaphragmatic wall of the LV. This is an image. This is the echo image and this is the cineangiogram image of the goose neck deformity. Here it shows the elongated and narrowed LV outflow tract. The decreased contribution of the left lateral leaflet to the AV valve circumference occurs in AVCD. Normally, the posterior mitral leaflet forms two-thirds of the mitral valve circumference. In case of AV canal defect, the left lateral defect, the left lateral leaflet forms only one third or less of the circumference of the AV valve. There is inferior displacement of the AV node, the coronary sinus and the bundle of his. The bundle courses at the inferior rim of the basal portion of the interventricular septum, known as the nodal triangle. In patients with complete AVCD and heterotaxy syndromes, sometimes two AV nodes may also be found. This is the picture showing a normal heart where the AV node is located at the apex of the triangle of cock. In case of an AV canal heart, the AV node is located in the nodal triangle, which is not at the tip. This is the nodal triangle and the, this is the location of the AV node. The position of the AV node and the bundle, sub, bundle of his is important during the surgical repair of the AV canal defect. In about 5% of cases, there may be the presence of single papillary muscle in the left ventricle. And this is most common in, in case of a complete AV canal type of defect. All the chordae of the left AV valve leaflets insert into the single papillary muscle usually situated anteriorly in the LV. The LV or RV may also be severely hypoplastic in about 7-8% to of these patients with complete AV canal and severe ventricular hypoplasia increases the risk of surgical correction and may require single ventricle that is the Fontan type of repair. Coming to the Rastelli classification, in 1966 Rastelli and colleagues described the classification of complete AV canal based on the extent of bridging of the left superior leaflet across the interventricular septum. In case of complete AVCD, the left inferior leaflet is usually underdeveloped, short, immobile with rolled up edges. Coming to Rastelli type A of defect, 
This is the most common type of defect in case of complete AVCD. There is no or very minor bridging of the left superior leaflet. Instead, its chordae are attached to the crest of the interventricular septum. The superior bridging leaflet can be divided into the left and the right components. The inferior bridging leaflet is rarely divided and there is, it is often attached by a short dense chordae to the crest of the interventricular septum. Here we can see the left, left bridging leaflet is divided into the superior and inferior components. Into, it is divided into the right and left components. Sorry. The Rastelli type B is a very rare kind of defect of complete AVCD. It is often associated with unbalanced type of AVCD. Here, the superior bridging leaflet is partially divided into right and left components. And there is min mild grade 2 to grade 3 bridging of the left superior leaflet. The chordae may be attached to either to the right side of the interventricular septum or to a prominent papillary muscle on the RV side. The moderator band is also often short. The Rastelli type C is again a common type of defect and it is associated with other complex heart, heart lesions such as tetralogy of fallow, TGA and DORV. There is extensive bridging of the superior left superior leaflet. The chordae are free floating and they are not attached to the crest of the interventricular septum. Rather, they may be attached to the anterolateral papillary muscle on the RV side. There are multiple cardiac anomalies which may be associated with AVCD. Most commonly, it is associated with patent ductus arteriosus, tetralogy of fallow, DORV with pulmonary stenosis, TGA, common atrium, unroofed coronary sinus with left SVC, pulmonary vascular disease, large inlet type of VSD and heterotaxy syndromes. Now reviewing the pathophysiology and symptoms. Left to right shunt is present in all cases of AVCD unless there is existing pulmonary vascular disease or coexisting right ventricular outflow obstruction. Patient presentation depends on the extent of the left to right shunt which depends on the pulmonary vascular resistance. In the initial first few, of, few weeks of life as the pulmonary vascular resistance falls this left to right shunt increases rendering the child more symptomatic with features of congestive heart failure, poor weight gain, tachypnea, tachycardia and sweating. In 10 to 15 percent of these cases, significant AV valve regurgitation is present, left more than the right. This increases the left to right shunt considerably. This causes increase in left and right ventricular stroke volume, cardiomegaly, tachypnea, tachycardia, poor feeding, failure to thrive and progressive heart failure in infancy. Without treatment, patients with partial AVCD and large interatrial communications rarely survive beyond 40 years of age. Atrial arrhythmias are very common, they increase with age and are a poor prognostic sign with associated high risk for post-op complications. In case of partial AVCD, the shunt is located only at the atrial level and these patients with, lit patients with little or no AV valve regurgitation have clinical presentation similar to that of patients with ostium secundum ASD. The degree of shunt across the ASD depends, depends on the relative diastolic component compliance of the two ventricles. The RV stroke volume is increased. The RV systolic pressure may be normal or slightly increased. Some patients may remain asymptomatic for years. Patients with complete AVCD have a large left to right shunt because of the large unrestricted VSD. 
The degree of shunt here depends mainly on the pulmonary vascular resistance. The pathophysiology is similar to that of a large non-restricted VSD but there are two additional features. There is a shunt at the atrial level which has the potential to causing LV to RA shunt and there is increased volume load of the ventricle. Also there is AV valve regurgitation which adds to the biventricular volume overload. Tachypnea, failure to thrive, cardiomegaly, reduced distal perfusion in the first few months are common features. Irreversible changes in pulmonary vasculature can be seen as early as 6 months in patients with unrepaired complete AVCD. The, this process of development of irreversible pulmonary arterial hypertension is increased and it is accelerated in the presence of Down syndrome mainly because of increased bronchial secretion, there is decreased number of distal bronchi, the lung parenchyma is, parenchyma is abnormal, there may be oropharyngeal obstruction due to thick tongue hyperventilation, there is presence of sleep apnea, tracheobronchomalacia and carbon dioxide retention. As pulmonary vascular occlusive disease progresses, eventually the shunt reverses and Eisenmenger complex develops with progressive cyanosis. In any case, without surgery, patients with, un in with complete AVCD usually die by 2 years of age. Primary causes of death are the, in the first several years are severe heart failure and recurrent pul pulmonary infections. In summary, we can see these are the types of AVCD. This is the complete AVCD where there is a large interventricular and interatrial communication with presence of single annulus. There is only single valve orifice and a common AV valve leaflets. In case of partial AV canal, there is only communication at the atrial level which is a primal atrial septal defect. There is no communication in the interventricular level and there are two separate annuli which almost normally developed AV valves. In case of transitional AVCD, there is a minor communication at the interventricular level and a communication at the interatrial level although there are two separate valve annuli. In case of intermediate AV canal, again there are two communication at both levels atrium and ventricle and the two annuli are partially developed. Intermediate AV canal and partial AV canal have similar valve anatomy because here only a tongue of tissue divides the common AV valve into right and left components. Complete and intermediate types have similar physiology because of the existing defects and the the components of the valve leaflets and the transitional and partial A AVCDs have another group of similar physiology. The physical findings in case of AVCD can be in the form of facial dysmorphism in case of Down syndrome, there may be a hyperactive precordium pre with presence of systolic thrill at left lower sternal border, the S1 is accentuated. The S2 is split and fixed with loud P2. There may be a grade 3 or grade 4 pansystolic murmur along the left sternal border. The murmur may be transmitted to the back and may also be well appreciated at the apex when there is a significant mitral regurgitation. A mid-diastolic rumble may be present as a result of functional stenosis of mitral or tricuspid valve. Hepatomegaly or gallop rhythm may also be present. The chest x-ray reveals cardiomegaly due to LV, RV and RA enlargement and there is increased pulmonary plethora because of increased left to right shunt. LA enlargement may be seen in case of a restrictive ostium primum defect. In patients with complete AVCD who survive beyond the initial stages they ha and have a very high PVR. The heart may be less enlarged and there is hugely dilated main pulmonary artery with relatively lung fields being clear.
The ECG shows usually sinus rhythm with prolonged PR interval. There is less left axis deviation with axis deviating between minus 40 to minus 150 degrees. There is increased RVH. The ECG may also show signs of LVH in certain cases. On echography, e echocardiography, the main interest is to find out the size and the extent of the interventricular and interatrial communication, the valve leaflet morphology including papillary muscle anatomy, the presence of AV valve regurgitations and the caudal attachments, presence of any parachute mitral valve component, any accessory tissues, the relative balance of the common AV valve orifice over the two ventricles, any other associated cardiac and non-cardiac defects. The limitations of echocardiography are the lack of sensitivity for a double orifice left AV valve and also there is inability to assess the quantitatively pulmonary vascular resistance and reactivity. This is the image, this is the cut section of the heart, four chamber view showing the primum ASD. RA and RV and the communication at the interventricular level and the, both the AV valves are at the same level. The same can be appreciated, the same image can be appreciated on the echo in a corresponding four chamber diastolic image. This shows the Doppler scan from the apex showing a large left to right shunt crossing the primum ASD. This image shows that this is the Doppler image, flow image displaying the moderate right and left AV valve regurgitations. Here we can see the abnormally elongated LV outflow tract. This is the normal heart where the inlet to outlet ratio is usually equal. In case of AVCD, this outlet septum is enlarged and there is shortening of the inlet septum leading to the characteristic goose neck deformity. Cardiac catheterization is usually required only when major other cardiac anomalies coexist and when the operability is doubtful because of evidence of pulmonary vascular disease. The cardiac cath helps in defining the direction and magnitude of shunting. It helps in diagnose, it helps in detecting the exact pulmonary artery and systemic artery pressure, resistance and flows. The RA right and the left ventricular pressures can be measured and the reactivity of the pulmonary vasculature can be measured. This is the cine angiogram showing the AVCD with two different AV valve orifices and the intervent. This is the right AV valve orifice, this is the left AV valve orifice and this is the interventricular communication seen between the two of them. Here also we can appreciate the characteristic gooseneck deformity. Natural history depends on the morphology and the functional details of the malformation. In case of partial AV canal only and with mild left AV valve regurgitation, no major cardiac anomaly, the history without surgical treatment is similar to that of a large ostium secundum ASD. Pulmonary vascular disease develops in a very small number of patients and that too in the second or fourth decades of life. As in the other type of large ASD, symptomatic deterioration occurs usually with the development of AF or systemic hypertension. In case of partial AVCD and moderate or severe left AV valve regurgitation, they have a different natural history. There is severe LA and pulmonary venous hypertension, these are absent due to non-restrictive VSDs, due to non-restrictive ASD. The left to right shunt is large and the PA pressure is usually at least moderately elevated. Almost 20% of such individuals are severely symptomatic in infancy and without surgical treatments, they die in the first decade of life. Cardiac arrhythmias in surgically untreated patients with partial AV canal, according to age, there is an incid increased incidence in case of arrhythmias in these patients with partial AVCD. 
As the age progresses, the incidence of arrhythmias increases progressively. In case of patients with complete AV canals, they have a still unfavorable history. An important event in the natural history is development of severe pulmonary vascular disease. This complication becomes more apparent between the 7 to 12 months of age in 30% of patients and is probably present in all the patients by 3 to 5 years of age. A child surviving up to the 1 year of age has only 15% chances of surviving till the age of 5 without any surgical treatment. Those who die in the first 2 years of life usually have heart failure with or without recurrent RTI as a result of large left to right shunt and moderate to severe AV valve regurgitation which is present in 60% of the patients. The high incidence of death in later age, valve regurgitation and increasing pulmonary vascular disease become dominant factors in the natural history. Histologically advanced pulmonary vascular disease is occasionally present in infants and even in the first year of life. This pulmonary vascular disease is more, more prominent in patients with complete AVCD and Down syndrome as seen earlier. In the next lecture, we will be seeing the indications of surgery, the exact surgical aspects, complications, survival and certain special situations related to the AV, uh, related to the AV canal defects. Thank you.